in Galatians chapter 6. And we ended last week with Paul's exhortation to Christians. This is Paul commanding Christians to never give up. <clears throat> Let's start all over. Good morning, everyone. We'll open our hymnals this morning. Uh, you know, that last song, it always impresses me. I mean, makes an impression on me when I read that verse. Um, or that, that stanza. The question that's asked in the song is, Do thy friends despise and forsake thee? I don't know if anybody has a friend quite like the friend I have from childhood, my oldest living friend who, because I am a Christian pastor, says that I am not good for the planet. Uh, I personally have a friend who has forsaken and denied fellowship with me. Uh, I've known him since kindergarten. The story goes, he says, I walked into the kindergarten classroom and looked around and pointed him out and said, you and me are going to be friends. I don't know whether I did that. I don't remember that. But he says he remembers it like it was yesterday. Uh, I became a Christian. I, I got into church. I started learning about the Lord. Many, many years later, I decided to go to seminary. And when I told him that, we were done. Not good for the planet. Whatever you have to offer, whatever you, Christian, whatever you're going to do from a pulpit is not good for, for planet Earth. Uh, as if to say, I would think, that if you could die, that would probably be a good thing for us. Happens. Uh, maybe you can tell a similar story. But I say that because of the first statement that I just made. We ended last week with Paul's exhortation to the Christians to never give up. To never give up, to never be discouraged, to never uh, uh, be like that guitar string, that violin string, that harp string that's, that's just loose and useless. And that's what happens to the Christian. We struggle and we struggle and we do right and we, we learn the Bible and we try to please this God of ours and we walk according to a certain code, at least we try to in our lives. And we have others around us that are peeling off, calling us certain things, telling us that we're uh, not tolerant. I mean, there's a lot that's heaped on a Christian's heart today. And so Paul's exhortation in Galatians is in Galatians 6, 9 is don't stop living the Christian life because others aren't pleased by it. You're not trying to please others. You're trying to please God. We live for God, not for men. All things you do, do as unto the Lord, not as, not as men pleasers, but as those seeking to please God. So he says in Galatians 6, 9, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time, in God's due time, at the proper time, we will reap, we will bear the fruit, we will see the fruit of our good that we do in this life if we don't grow weary. And that's that word, that guitar string that's loosened or even broken, that's of no profitability to the music anymore. It can't make a melody. It can't, it can't produce a harmony. It's just done for because it's worn out. And Paul warns Christians, and we went through the life of Paul a little bit in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of just what it cost Paul to be a Christian. I've paid the price for being a Christian. I know that you have paid the price with some people in your lives for being an outspoken Christian, a loving Christian, but nonetheless outspoken. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'll preach it to anybody that'll hear. And sometimes you get pounded for that. And Paul says, you think you get pounded for it. I got beat for it. I got stoned for it. I got imprisoned for it. So don't give up. Don't lose heart. That's where we ended. And now we have to shift away from that because in verse 10, he turns from our responsibilities as a congregation toward the teachers of the word. Remember, that's where we were in 6.6. Everyone who has taught the word should share all good things with those who teach the word. He's moving on to our next responsibility as a church, and that is our responsibility to all people. And this encompasses all of us. This is our Christian responsibility to all people. Now, let me make this statement because we definitely do not live under the Mosaic law. We're not Old Testament Jews. We're living in the church age. And we have rules of our own, over a thousand commands in the New Testament that we are to follow. But those Old Testament laws, 
are not ours. They're not given to the church. They were given to Israel. So Paul, part of Paul's argument has been through Galatians, we are not bound by the law. You've got these people coming into your churches in Galatia, and they are telling you that you have to believe in the Lord Jesus and add to His work keeping the Mosaic law by eating certain foods and abstaining from certain foods. That's legalism. It's not for the church. That's legalism. That's adding to the Word of God something that's not in it. He says, don't do that. Don't become circumcised because circumcision is of no avail to you. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, this is the church now and things are different. So legalism and the Judaizers have come into the church and Paul is saying, no, we are not under the Mosaic law. We're free from it. And it was for freedom that Christ set you free. But here's my statement. Just because we're free from the Old Testament Jewish Mosaic law does not mean we are free from all responsibilities. It doesn't mean, oh, Christian, you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now just go out and do whatever you want to do in this life. There are still bounds on the Christian. There are still regulations and responsibilities laid on us in the New Testament. Not the old, the new. So, I just don't want you to hear anything that I say saying, well, this guy must think that we could just go out and do anything we want to do because we're free from any restraint. That's not what I say and that's not what Paul said. There's enormous restraint for the Christian. But a freedom that comes from not having to work. Uh, anyway, I, gotta, I, I want to move on from that thought or I'll be there. I just don't want to get stuck there. We have responsibilities as Christians. And part of our responsibility is, is laid out in verse 10. And what he says is, So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people. And you say, well, that's just all people in the church. No, it's not. Keep reading. Let the Bible define itself. Let us do good to all people, and especially on top of doing good for everybody, especially to those who are of the household of the faith. And we call that the church. So we Christians have a responsibility to everyone that we see. And you say, well, I don't want that responsibility to everyone that I see. But God has laid that responsibility on the Christians. Listen, we are the representatives of Jesus Christ. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father. We are His hands and feet on this earth. We do His bidding. We go out and preach the Word of God to people. Have you ever heard the statement, you may be the only Bible some people ever read? Your lifestyle, your choices, your language, the, your relationships with other people, with your boss. Some people say, uh-oh, you just stepped on my toes. Yeah, I used to have relationships with the boss. A working relationship. I was in the working world for 30 years. I get it. But your relationship with everybody should reflect a relation. The light of Jesus Christ is what it should reflect. It should reflect love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, all of that. We have dire relationships between, uh, before the Lord God. So that's what Paul is saying here. I want to pick this apart a little bit. He says, while we have an opportunity. Remember what analogy Paul has just used, this analogy of the farmer, that there's a season to plant, there's a season to, uh, to harvest. What he's saying here is, just like there's a season to plant and harvest, there's also a season to do good for the Lord. And what is that season? When does that season start and when does that season end? When does the season to do good for the Lord, to represent the Lord, when does that begin and when does that end for you? I mean, certainly there's got to be a little bit of time where you can lay off being that representative of the Lord and just relax. Just breathe a little bit. True or false? Or are we in what the Bible calls full-time Christian service? You know, a lot of people want to point up at the pastor, no, sir, you're in full-time Christian service. Well, let me point back at you and say, no, we are in full-time Christian service. This is for each of us, not just the pastor. 
So this idea of while we have the opportunity is always without stop. Every day you wake up and breathe this mortal human air, you are called to be a representative of Jesus Christ before everybody you see. That's a tough one. You say, oh, but we're free from the Mosaic law, so we don't have to bring a lamb and a turtle dove. And I'm thinking, wow, I'd rather bring a lamb and a turtle dove than be saddled with this one because this is some big, heavy carrying right here. Do good to all people. I don't want your minds to wander, but I'm sure there's someone that you could think of just like that who you just really don't want to share the love of Christ with for whatever reason. But Paul doesn't say you have, a, you have choices in this. Paul says in this life as Christians, once you become a Christian, I ask you a question, when does this start? It starts when you become a Christian because he's not speaking to unbelief here. He's not speaking to the lost world. He's speaking to the church of Jesus Christ, speaking to us. So while we have the opportunity during this lifetime as Christians, we are always and to never stop doing the good for all people. Notice that he says, let us. Us, not you. This isn't Paul on some lofty perch saying, I don't have to do this. You little people have to do this. No, Paul recognizes the truth. Paul would have never, never, that thought would have never crossed Paul's mind. He uses the word us. He includes himself because the responsibility of the Christian toward all people uh, is for all people, all Christians. Good here. He says, let us do good. I think I have a slide. Let us do good. Let us do good. Let us keep on working the good. That do is the word poema. It means to do, to work. Um, no, it's not that word. I'm sorry. Forget that. But it means uh, that literally what the Greek would say here is let us keep on. It's a present tense word, this word do. Let us keep on, presently, keep on in your life working the good for all people. That's what Paul is saying. And good here... I wrote this down because I thought it would be useful. Good here refers not only to what is useful and profitable. You think, well, my neighbor needs a fence built, so I'm going to go over and help my neighbor build his fence. Is that good and useful and profitable? Yeah, it would be, of course. But good here refers to way beyond just what's useful and profitable, and it brings this idea of morality and ethics into the into the situation. Do what is morally good. Do what is morally right. And that changes our responsibility to all people. Good here also includes kindness. Agathos is the word. You know anybody named Agatha? It comes from this Greek word for good. A-G-A-T-H-O-S. Agathos. That's the word for good, and it also includes kindness. So not only are we to do what is morally right toward everybody on earth, I mean, listen to what's laid at our feet. Not, are we, not only are we supposed to do what's morally right, we're also supposed to do it with kindness. And I don't know about you, but certain people jump into my head. My friend that I talked to you about. The next time I see my friend, and I'm sure in this life I'll bump into him again. What is my responsibility toward him? I know what he's chosen for me. But does that change my responsibility to do what's morally right and do it kindly to Him? Does that let me off the hook is my question. No, it doesn't. God's not looking at Him. God's looking at me. I'm the Christian. God's, God's judging me, evaluating me based on what I do, not based on who He puts in my path. Well, that person's unlovable. That person hates me. That person this... Remember, I go back to the spirit of Jesus Christ and the love that was in him. What were his words when he was nailed to a cross? A man never knew hatred like that day. And what was Jesus' word? The one who we are to imitate. The one who's, who's uh, going before us and his laying down of the Christian way of life. The one that we're to learn from and imitate. When he was hated the most on this earth, when they beat him and scourged him and spit on him, and hit him in the face and put the crown of thorns on him and mocked him with the purple robe on him. What was Jesus' mentality the whole time? It was good. 
It was morally right and it was kind to the people that wanted him dead more than anyone, the Jews of his day and the Gentiles. Jesus cried out to the Father and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. See, that's the call. That's the call. And it's a giant call. So what is Paul saying here? I'll paraphrase it. I think Paul is saying, let us keep on working the right deeds, the morally right deeds for all people with kindness. But you can't forget the context of Galatians 5 and 6 by means of God the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this, Christian, on your own without the power of God the Holy Spirit giving you the ability to do this. Can't be done. In Galatians chapter 5, he says, I say, walk by the Spirit, live according by means of God the Holy Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. There's a contrast here between the Christian living and, and being supported by God the Holy Spirit or doing it according to his own flesh. And that's what's at stake here. That's the context here. So Paul is teaching that Christians have a choice. This word choice pops up on every word of the, in every page of the Bible. We have a choice to live according to God the Holy Spirit, where we, where we can do what is morally right and kind to people that would be impossible to do otherwise. Or the other side of the choice is to live according to our sinful natures. Even as Christians, we have sinful natures and say, you, what, you know what, neighbor? I'm not treating you with moral rightness or kindness. I hate you, and you've got to know that. And we have that choice. But what does the God, the Holy Spirit, and Paul present to us here as the right path? And that is to let us keep on doing good deeds, right and moral deeds for all people with kindness. That is a gigantic order for the Christian gigantic. I know that you men probably go to work, and I'm speaking as a guy who went to work and had bosses. I'm sure somewhere in your boss chain, there's someone who you believe just doesn't deserve it. They treat me in a way that I cannot show them Good. I cannot show them good. I can't be morally right before that person, and I can't be kind to them. They want to fight with me, they're going to get a fight. But Paul says the opposite in this. Paul says, and he says it in other places too, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. We see that in Romans chapter 12. The Christian has a high call. Listen, every breath you take, you wear the coat of Jesus Christ. You are to represent your Savior in all circumstances. You don't think God knows who that boss is? You don't think God put that boss there to, to test you, to grow you? Yes, He did, and yes, He does. Nothing's by accident in this world. Hard things. Listen, it's very easy for me to say these, but I can tell you that in the 20 years of working in the workforce, in the, in the outside world workforce, I failed at this daily. I hadn't grown enough. God hadn't become big enough. If I went back into the workforce now knowing more, having grown more, having understood God better, knowing more about what's command, demanded of me in the Scripture, maybe I would do better. But I'm still a sinning man, and if you push hard enough, I'll push back. That's what we face. That's what we face every day when you go out into this world. That's what we face. God knows it. And He says... This is what I have called into your life. This is how I am molding the clay. This will grow you if you let it. This will grow you. God doesn't want to ungrow us. He doesn't want to stifle our growth. He wants to put into our lives what will grow us the fastest so we can be better representatives of His Son, Jesus Christ. You get it? God's interested in this. Come on, son, let's go. 
I got things for you to do. I've called you to be a representative of the Lord. I need you. You're the hands and feet. Jesus sits right here. I've called you as a Christian to work good works in the sight of all men so that these unbelievers in the world would see you and say, man, there's something different about that guy. There's a code that he lives by that's not what I'm seeing on TikTok. It's not what I'm seeing on Facebook. It's not what I'm hearing on the news. There is something stable about this person, and I want to know what it is. That's who we're supposed to be. Not the whiner, not the complainer, not the one that says, oh, you have no idea how bad I have it. There's nothing new under the sun, Christian. You may, And I'm not trying to d- diminish what you're going through. Not any of you. What I'm trying to convince you of is that God has put it in your life right now for growth. Even if it's discipline to you, it's so you'll turn back to God and grow so that you can better represent His Son on this earth. And that's that's what Paul is saying here in Galatians chapter 10. In this life, as Christians, we have the opportunity and we have to keep on working the right deeds for all people. That's everybody. And then he says, especially, especially to those who are of the family of God. The idea here is that you can treat your neighbor a certain way, but don't you treat your brother and your sister a little more intimately, a little more closer? We are family We share a father, and we always will. The church is united as family. We're not just people that know each other. We are this organism that's being fit together by God. We're the bride of Jesus Christ who will be presented as a virgin to the Lord Jesus Christ one day. The amalgamation, this body called the church, will enter into marriage with Jesus Christ forever. We are family. And so to the household of the church, to our brothers and sisters, we have to tend to each other's needs first. And I don't know why the Bible is written like this. Maybe some people have a tendency... Maybe for some people it's easier to help and to do morally good things outside the church, but inside the church it's more difficult. So the Holy Spirit had to lay it out like this before Paul. Do good to all people, but don't forget the church, especially the church. This is this word for above all or especially in the... uh, New American Standard Bible, it says especially. And this is what it means. It's the word malista, and it means to a distinctly greater extent. Distinctly able to be seen that your commitment to the church and the church family is a degree higher than a common commitment that you may have to your neighbor or your friend. Our relationship is way more Uh, way richer than any other relationship we have with anyone. We are the family of God. We're the sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We are the ones, all of us together as a unit, who are going to be presented to God, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, as a virgin wife to Jesus Christ forever. So Paul says we have an obligation not only to others but to the church. To the church. The the care of the church family is critically important. It's of first importance. you got to take care of the family first. Don't take care of everybody else and neglect the family, the church. I want to show you a couple of verses here. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. I like this verse because this is Paul speaking to a pastor. This is like that, that backroom communication. You know, I go to a pastor's conference every year in Houston, and there's 40 or 50 pastors there, and we have fantastic conversation because it's not, it's not backroom in the sense that, oh, it's secret, you can't hear it. It's just pastors saying, hey, I'm having a struggle with this. How can I do this? I've got new members. How do I this? 
And, and it goes, we just talk about things that are real that are happening in the church. And so Paul here is teaching a pastor how to run the church. The book in 1st and 2nd Timothy is that, and the book of Titus is the same thing. Paul teaching a young pastor how to run the church. How is the church to conduct itself? And I love these books, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Paul says, but in case I am delayed, because he tells Timothy he wants to go visit, he said, in case I am delayed, I'm writing to you this letter, this very letter, I'm writing it so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. So there is a way that the Christian in the church is to live, and there's a way that we're not to live. And Paul says, I'm writing you this letter so you as the leader of the congregation will know what to say, know what to teach, know how to guide people in how they are to conduct themselves, how they're to behave in the church, which he calls the household of God. I tell you, we're a family which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the support of truth. Now, I say that the care of the church and the church family is critically important, of first importance. And the reason I say that is because the church, and that's not this place, that's not this, these walls, that's not this building, it's us. We are the church. We are the ones indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit. We make up the church, not this place. This is just the place we gather. We call it the church building, but we are the church, make no mistake. And it's the gathering of human believing souls, which is the church of the living God. And what are we collectively, when we get together, when the church gets together, what is the church to do? What does Paul say about the church to Timothy, his pastor? In your church, Timothy, you are the pillar and the support of the truth. The whole church in all of the world. Look at this picture. On all of the earth as we know it, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ all over the globe today are what God calls the pillars and the support of His truth. We are the custodians of the truth of God, each of us and us as a church. We, He has placed the custody of the truth of God, this, into our hands. So the care of the church is critically important. I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts here. The word for, for pillar, what is the church? Who are we? In this world, we're the foundation or the base. That's what the word pillar means. You know what a pillar is? A, a tall column, usually really big, that holds up the weight of things. So it's a base or it's a foundation. That's the word pillar here. And the word for support means also very much the same thing, a support or a foundation or a firm base. Paul says to Timothy, his young pastor friend, you are leading, Timothy, in all of the earth. God has placed before you the responsibility to hold up the truth of Jesus Christ. You are the firm base. You hold up the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. Who else is going to do it if the church doesn't? What unbeliever is qualified to be the custodian of the truth of God? None. We are. And that's why we have to take care of the church first. But let me ask you this question. When he says the church is the foundation and the firm support underneath all of God's truth, is he talking about this truth? Or is he talking about Jesus Christ? Let me show you a couple of verses. I'll help you make your decision. John 17, 17. Who's speaking in John 17, 17? Jesus Christ. Who's He speaking to? He's speaking to God the Father. John 17 is what we call the high priestly prayer where Jesus Christ, as high priest, goes directly to God the Father and has a conversation. 
You ever want to know? I just talked about the secret behind the, behind the uh, closed doors conversation between pastors. We have in our hands, in John chapter 17, the most sacred of words ever written. We have a conversation between the Godhead, God the Father and God the Son in conversation. An amazing piece of writing. And in John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus says concerning His disciples, His believers, His followers, His sheep, He's asking the Father to sanctify us in the truth. Set them apart by the truths that they know. Sanctify them in the truth. And then He defines what truth is. Your word is truth. So let me ask you this. Is this Bible, according to Jesus Christ, your Savior, did Jesus Christ consider these words pure godly truth? Yes, He did. So is the church to uphold, are we the support and the firm foundation for all the truths that are taught in the world from the Bible? Yes, we are. But let me show you another verse. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus in that same upper room discourse the night before He was crucified... Jesus says this concerning Himself. He said to them, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Me. Because Jesus says, you believe in the Father, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in the Father, believe in Me also. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. But I'm going to My Father's house to prepare a place for you, so that where I am there you may be also. And if I go to prepare a place, then I will come back and I will receive you to myself, that where I am you will be also. So Jesus is promising them, I am going to heaven, I am leaving earth. But make no mistake, I've got a job to do there. I'm preparing a place for you personally. And because I'm leaving, I'm promising I will come back to earth and take you home with me. And so they ask the question, how can, we know where, how can we know the way if we don't even know where you're going? And Jesus answers them, I am the way. You want to know how to get to heaven? On my shoulders and what I'm going to do for you in the morning. I'm going to be crucified and buried. And three days from now, I will be resurrected to life. That's the way. So he says, I'm the way. But he also adds this second thought. I am pure truth. I don't speak truth. I embody truth. Everything about me is perfectly true. My character, my words, my thoughts, my eternal existence, everything is perfectly true. So if the Word of God is truth and Jesus told us that it was, sanctify them, Father, in truth your Word is truth. And then Jesus in the same conversation earlier that night tells the disciples, I myself am the truth. And we go to the Bible and it says the church is the pillar and the firm support for the truth on earth. Are we supporting the truth of the Bible or the truth of Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection? What's the answer? Yes. Yes, that's right. We're supporting Jesus Christ and we're supporting the truth that He taught through His men. So it's a huge responsibility that the church has that each of us have as the supports and the foundations of the truth of God on this earth. It's us. And so of first importance, we should make sure that we are taken care of, that each of us, that our needs are met, that nobody feels like they've been left, left aside, turned aside in the church. We have to take care of each other because of the huge responsibilities that are laid upon us by God. I want to go back for a minute to this idea of let us keep on working the righteous deeds. I want to show you a slide. We're going to close with this slide. It'll take a few minutes to go through it. Working good deeds. This is a big subject to chew off. But let me say this. Let me ask you a couple of questions. As Christians, can you still sin? Yes or no? As Christians, children of God, when you choose to sin, 
Is God pleased with you at that moment? While you have that sin, and that sin hasn't been confessed, is your relationship, not your eternal relationship with your Father, that is settled forever, but is your moment-by-moment relationship with God because you have chosen to sin against Him, is there, uh, let's just say, a rift in the relationship? Yes. Yes. And so, if during that time of the rift in the relationship because of any sin you've committed and not confessed, if you do something that looks good and is profitable, if you do something for someone that looks good, even sacrificially, is God pleased with that work? Yes or no? Be careful. Think about that one. You're walking in a part of your relationship with the Lord that, is, that has a rift in it. You fathers, you mothers will know this. You make rules in your house. Your kids break the rules. Until the kid comes to you and the relationship is restored, that's still your son and your daughter and you die for that child. But there's a problem in the relationship, is there not? There's a problem in that relationship. So that kid goes and he tries to do something good for his sister and he comes back, Daddy, Daddy, I did this. You should be proud of me. No, there's a problem in our relationship right now. And until we clear up that problem, it doesn't matter what you do, son. I'm not going to be pleased with it. True statement? Yeah, true statement. So the reason I added to the, the statement that I made earlier that we are to do the right deeds for all people with kindness by means of God the Holy Spirit is because there's this truth weaved into the Bible and it comes to us certainly in Galatians chapter 5 that there is a way a Christian walks with God the Holy Spirit and there is a way that a Christian walks apart from God the Holy Spirit in sin pleasing himself. Right? Fair enough? You get that idea? I want to show you a couple of, of thoughts here. Because Paul says, keep on working the good. What I'm trying to tell you is there's a way to work the good that pleases the Father and earns you rewards, eternal rewards in heaven. And there's a way as a Christian walking in sin that it doesn't matter what it does or how good it, what you do or how good it looks. The Father says, son, we've got something to take care of first. Don't go try to please me. Let's take care of this sin issue first and then go back out and do the good for all people with kindness. So there are steps to spiritual production. There are steps to bearing fruit for God. The Bible teaches us these steps. Spiritual production just basically is applying a truth that you know. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Did you, each of you this morning, for, did you obey that or disobey that? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, do not forsake assembling, getting together. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. Did you do that or did you obey that? You obeyed it. Each of you is in church. You obeyed the command of God to not forsake this assembling together. You thought it was important enough to come and meet with the church, and that's why you're here, in obedience to the Word of God. That is, a, that is bearing fruit for God. It doesn't have to be something great that moves the earth. You showing up to church is bearing fruit for God. If... If there's no sin that has damaged your moment-by-moment -moment relationship with God. So I, I give you this just as a point of uh, trying to see it better. What's going on here? What are our choices as Christians? Look at these steps. Number one, how could you ever produce anything spiritually if you weren't saved and a child of God? It's impossible. The unbeliever, even though they can do things that look wonderful to the world, don't please God, not one drop. The only thing an unbeliever can do that pleases God the Father is to believe in the Son that He sent for them, to accept their, their sin bearer that the Father sent. Salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. 
Nothing else needs to be said. You've got to be saved before this is even a truth for you. Number two, you have to be filled by means of God the Holy Spirit. And you think, now we're getting off into some strange language. No, we're not. No, we're not. This is all biblical. I could show you verses. But in, if he, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul gives this choice for Christians, this contrast. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, this is what Paul says. I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You see the difference? You can either walk in the Spirit, or if you're not walking by means of God the Holy Spirit, you will be walking by means of your sin nature. You will be fulfilling the lusts of your own flesh. <laughs> or that, that sin that keeps trying to motivate us to walk away from God. Filling by means of God the Holy Spirit. You say, well, now wait a minute. Is, is this some sort of Pentecostal second blessing filling of God the Holy Spirit? Nope, not, nope, not, that's not Bible. That's not Bible. This is all I mean by this. This is all the Bible means by this. When you are walking in that eternal relationship with God and you have committed a sin that you have not confessed and you have not given God the opportunity to forgive you of, when you have that barrier to your fellowship, God the Holy Spirit has been quenched. Have you ever read those verses, read those? Do not quench the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Because God the Holy Spirit has come into you, Christian, to live inside you for a purpose. For a purpose, for a reason. Because He wants to guide us in all our thinking. He wants to teach us the Word of God. He wants to recall to mind the Bible that we know. So He's come into us for a reason. And what I'm trying to tell you is, when you sin against this God, no matter what it is, you quench the Holy Spirit. It's like you've got this raging fire, God the Holy Spirit, trying to guide and lead you through this life, and you take a huge bucket of water and put the fire out. That's what sin does to the power of God, the Holy Spirit, in your life. It stops it for the moment. It stops it. It grieves the Holy Spirit because He's come into us to lead us and guide us through this life. But when we choose to sin, God, the Holy Spirit, who always indwells us and will never leave our bodies, He fills us. The Bible says, be filled. And He fills us. By, so we have to be filled by means of God the Holy Spirit. We have to be in, we have to confess our sins. I'll say it this way. If you have a sin, God says, confess the sin and I will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So at the moment we come clean with the Father, we are instantly and again, the Holy Spirit is unquenched. He's working in our lives. He's guiding us, leading us, teaching us, comforting us, exhorting us, convicting us, all those things. Because we have no problem with our relationship with God. And then when we choose to sin again, we're walking according to our sin nature, according to our flesh, choosing to do whatever we want to do in this world. We've quenched and set God the Holy Spirit aside and said, you know what, thanks, but no thanks, I'll do this on my own. And that's the picture that we're seeing here. It's all I'm trying to paint. It's a very deep, it's a very deep concept if you've never thought through it. But God the Holy Spirit lives in us for a reason. And it's our actions that either energize Him or put Him on the sidelines. And that action is sin. So when you have confessed all your sins to the Father, whatever they may be, He forgives you, He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. And at that moment, nothing spooky, nothing mystical, the Bible teaches that at that moment you are walking according to God the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul is preaching in Galatians 5.16. Live your lives walking by means of God the Holy Spirit. Not in sin, walking according to your flesh. When you do sin, confess, get back into filling by means of God the Holy Spirit, what the Bible calls fellowship. Keep on moving forward. We could talk about that all day. What else do we have to do? We have to learn Bible truths. You come to the, you come to the, to the church, and almost every time we have a, a church service, I give the opportunity at the beginning of the service. 
I give the opportunity and I say, let's take a moment in silent prayer to make sure that we are in a proper relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And what I mean by that is, if you have a sin to confess or a host of sins, man, take the opportunity and do it right now because Bible learning is a spirit event. It's a human spirit and God the Holy Spirit event. That's why we do that, to make sure that we are in fellowship, that God the Holy Spirit is energized in our lives, that we haven't quenched Him or grieved Him. That's why we clean ourselves up before. We allow God to clean us by confessing our sins to Him. And we come here to learn Bible truths, to doctrines, if you want. Some of you are familiar with the word, and that's your background, the word doctrines or teachings. But these are the steps to spiritual production. You just can't become a Christian and all of a sudden do good things for God because as a brand new Christian, what you don't understand, I'm going to say it again, what you don't understand is your very first sin as a brand new Christian. Your very first sin hampers your relationship with this God. And until you understand confession of sin and what it does for us and letting God the Holy Spirit work in our lives again, there's no way you can produce fruit. You don't even know how. You don't know the mechanic. So we have to learn Bible truths and then we have to choose, and this is the hard part, we have to choose to apply those Bible truths to daily situations in life. So to you men and women who get a paycheck from an employer... Choose to apply Bible truths to daily situations in life. And this is what I'll lay at your feet. Paul's words, so then while you have the opportunity, and each of you do, keep on working the good toward all people. Keep on being a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you wake up morning in the morning and you brush your teeth and you get ready to go to work, have these thoughts in your minds. I am going there to represent my God. I am the Christian in the room. And if you're not shining the light of Jesus Christ in that room, who's going to? You have to choose to apply what you know. What do we know? We just learned that we're to do the good for all people, especially to those that are of the household of faith. So you have to do that. So a closing statement, without salvation, without filling by means of God the Holy Spirit, which again is not mystical. When you confess your sins, you are filled with God the Holy Spirit. When you sin, you're walking according to your flesh. You have got to keep a short account of sins. You've got to be a confessor of sins that, that temporarily destroys your relationship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it neutralizes you from doing anything that pleases God. You have to know that about this Bible and about yourself. Without salvation, without the filling by means of God the Holy Spirit, without learned Bible truths, without applying the Bible truth that we know, applying it to life, doing what it says, then the so-called spiritual life and production are no more than mysticism. If you don't know this mechanic that God clearly taught us in the Bible, then your spiritual life is going to be something like let go and let God. God will guide me into all things. He'll lead me on my path. He'll He'll not cause my foot to stumble. And that's not biblical truth. What the Bible says is these things. Become saved and a child of God. Learn the mechanic of confession of sins and what hampers your relationship. Learn Bible truths and choose to use these Bible truths to obey them and do them in your life. And that's what's pleasing to God the Father. That's what bears fruit. That system is what God lays out in the Bible for bearing fruit. So some way and somehow God will just work everything out in my life. That's not Bible truth. You want God to work everything out in your life? Learn the Bible, apply the Bible, the truths of Jesus Christ and the truths that Jesus taught us through other men and live according to this book. Otherwise, you're not doing Bible. You're not practicing Bible Christianity. This is Bible Christianity. There's a method to God, and this is the method He lays down in the Scripture. 
That's enough for today. Let's close in prayer. Oh, it's 12.05. It's really enough.